Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Ms. Arias, you are still under oath. Do you understand? Yes. You may proceed with direct examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Before we do so, uh, we'd be moving to admit Exhibit 428, the telephone conversation, the recorded phone call between uh, Ms. Arias and Mr. Alexander uh, testified to regarding Mr. Neumeister and just that conversation. Any objection? Pursuant to the record, we've made no objection. Exhibit 428 is admitted. Good morning, Ms. Arias. Yesterday, when we spoke, when we ended yesterday, I guess, we were talking about um, the time you spent, we were just getting into, I guess, the time you spent with Mr. Alexander in uh, Ehrenberg, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, before we get into that a little bit, let me back up. Could you describe... Uh, the town for Ehrenberg as it was uh, back in October 2006 when you were there? Um, I don't recall its size, but it was very small. Um, I think there was only one or two exits, maybe. And um, it's in the middle of the desert. I think it's actually in California, but it's right on the border. Apart from the midpoint that you described yesterday being a midpoint between you and Mr. Alexander, was there any other particular reason or activity that you were going to go to Ehrenberg? Um, I was driving out there specifically to hang out with Travis. But when you got there, there wasn't a, a particular lake or a particular site, park, or whatever that you were going to go to? No, not that I was aware of or that we had planned. It's not exactly a tourist destination. Okay. Now, yesterday you began to tell us about uh, arriving at the, the hotel room, and I believe your words were making out with Mr. Alexander, right? Yes. Okay. Um, if you could just kind of describe for us, and this was if within minutes of you arriving, to our understanding? Yes, it happened pretty quickly. Okay. Just... Go, begin again, describing what uh, happened during this makeout session as you describe it. You mean like in detail? Yes. Um, well, he opened the door for me because he had the room key. And um, he took my hand and walked me over to the bed, sort of. And kind, of kind of pulled me, but walked me. And I went willingly, of course. Um, we started kissing, it got a little more intense, a little more passionate, and then soon we were both nude on the bed. And um, there were certain things that um, he said that, well, like it, it's not, I don't know, we didn't have intercourse, so to speak. I and mean, there was oral sex that weekend, but um, and that particular day, um, we did what I guess he called, at that time he called it grinding. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, just being together, but not actually having intercourse. That's something that, that I guess a lot of Mormons do, but they're not supposed to. Um, there are different terms for it. Um, like the Provo push, and that's a Mormon implication. Um, it's in Utah. This is what um, I learned. So, um, I'm sorry. Okay, besides the grinding uh, and the, the oral sex, you said you didn't have intercourse during this encounter, this first encounter. Not vaginal intercourse, or maybe. Did you have anal intercourse? No. Just oral sex? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this would have been when, to recount for us, was this Thursday evening? Um, yesterday, I couldn't remember what it, whether it was Thursday or Friday, but I remember it was Thursday because we spent two nights there and he had to leave on Saturday. Okay. So you spent Thursday and Friday night together, he left on Saturday? 
Yes, we both parted ways on Saturday. Okay. So, after this first encounter where there was oral sex, and were you giving or receiving the oral sex? Uh, both. Uh, after this encounter, what happened? What did you do after this was over? There wasn't really anything to do for a while. We just, that night we stayed in the room, um, eventually went to sleep. He just flipped on the TV and we watched, um, it might have been Friday night, but we watched uh, some game shows, Deal or No Deal, um, different things. He was just flipping through the channels. Um, did you engage in any more sexual activity on Thursday night? Not after that. The next day, you wake up. What do you do? Do you go out and do something, or what happened? Um, the next day, we were trying to find some way to spend the day. Um, and the town of Blythe is near Ehrenberg, so we decided to drive to Blythe because there was a small movie theater there. And we watched a movie. We went to... Um, Sizzler, got something to eat. Let um, me ask you this. Did you engage in any sexual behavior before you went to the movie? I don't remember. Did you engage in any sexual behavior after the movie? Yes. And what, beha what behavior did you engage in? Um, that was oral sex. Was this again mutual? Yes. You mentioned previously that uh, this you saw this as somewhat of a romantic weekend with Travis. Um, was that what it was turning out to be? No. When you weren't engaged in sexual activity, how was he treating you? He wasn't treating me bad. Um, he just seemed checked out. You know, the whole time we were checked in, he was just kind of distant. Um, we connected, I thought we connected a lot over the phone, and it was different when we were together. How? Um, well, over the phone, we would talk for hours at a time about things, not just about sex, but other things, um, things of a spiritual nature, and. Um, just every subject that you could imagine, pleasant things. And um, we were discovering things that we had in common in ways we were different. And um, when, we sh when we went to Ehrenberg, I was expecting the same kind of energy or connection, but it would just be in person. Um, there wasn't much of a mental or emotional connection like there was on the phone. It was just primarily physical. What's that? Primarily physical. And if you could do us a favor and speak up again. I know Sorry. I'm having trouble hearing you. So. Were, at this point in time, were you and Mr. Alexander, would you consider yourselves to be in a, in a relationship? No, it wasn't anything defined. We were sort of seeing each other, but we were definitely not boyfriend-girlfriend. How many, well, you said on, how many sexual interactions did you have with Mr. Alexander over this time in Ehrenberg? Um, I would say three. I mean, total, if you just, you know. Okay. And these were all instances of sexual, or excuse me, oral sex? No. Um, like the first night, it was the grinding, and the next night was oral sex. Okay. And what was the third encounter? It was oral sex also. Okay. It was before we left. Okay. Did he ever express a desire during this weekend to engage in um, anal sex with you? Yes. And did he, over the course of that weekend in Ehrenberg, express a desire to have uh, vaginal sex with you? No.
but you do, it appears, based on what you've told us, you declined his desire to have anal sex. Is that correct? Yeah, he was, yeah, I did. I just, yes, I didn't, we did not have anal sex. Okay. In expressing his desire for that, was he, was that something he did repeatedly, or is that something that just came up one time? It didn't just come up one time. He wasn't overly persistent about it, but it was somewhat repeated. Okay. Apart from going to a movie and uh, out, out to eat in Blythe, as you just described, what else, and the sexual encounters, what else did you do to pass the time? Um, well, we made music CDs, or he made CDs on his computer with his music, some music that he liked that he was making for me. Um, he shared more things from the Book of Mormon with me. Um, what else did we do? Mostly it involved, if it, we weren't in Blythe, we were on, he was watching television other than those two, other two activities. Now in terms, and at this point in time, October 2006, you are, you have received several visits from the missionaries, right? From where you just yes. started, is that? Okay. Yes, by that time. Had you had occasion to, whether it's through the missionaries, through Mr. Alexander, through church visits, through your own readings, had you ever learned about what we're calling the vow of chastity? It was mentioned. It was mentioned to me, not in detail. And in October of 2006, when you're in, Bly in excuse me, not Blythe, but in Ehrenberg with uh, Mr. Alexander, what was your understanding of that vow? Uh, according to the missionaries, they were very, they sort of glossed over it, um, and they didn't really gloss over it, but. Okay, my understanding. What was your understanding, not telling us what somebody said to you, but what was your understanding of what the vow meant, what it prohibited? No premarital sex. And did you have an understanding of how that was defined? Within the, within the law, I mean, did it mean no penile vaginal intercourse? Did it mean no kissing? What what did that mean to your understanding? Well, it was explained to me by Travis. Um, Objection. What is your understanding that he's telling me? What was your understanding? My understanding was that it meant that vaginal sex was off limits and everything else was more or less okay. And who gave you that understanding? Travis did. Now you talked about uh, departing, uh, both you and, and Mr. Alexander leaving uh, Saturday morning. Tell us about that. Saturday morning we got breakfast at the um, the neighboring truck stop restaurant. Um, again, there wasn't much connection. We were just, there wasn't a lot of conversation. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot the question. Well, I, what I'm asking you is describe for us the Saturday morning when you left, you said you had breakfast. Uh, what happened? Who left first? Oh, okay. Um, after breakfast, um, he we left at the same time. We checked out, and um, I took a picture of him. He, he was in a suit and tie. He had to go to a Super Saturday here in Phoenix. It was 
one of the regional events in prepaid legal. And I, he, so he, he hit the road for Arizona, I mean from Phoenix, and I went back to Palm Desert. And how far, how far a drive was Palm Desert from Ehrenberg, as best you can recall? I want to say three hours, maybe, somewhere around that mark. Okay. Tell us how you felt leaving Ehrenberg that Saturday morning and driving back. Well, when we parted, there wasn't a lot of affection, so I kind of felt disappointed. Um, not upset, just kind of bummed out a little bit. Um, I don't know, kind of felt stupid. Stupid how? Um, I was replaying the weekend, or it was, it was my weekend. I was replaying that weekend, and it just, I kind of wish things had gone a little bit differently. Um, what do you mean by that? Maybe just, I had, I wish that we had had more of a, a connection, a, a meeting of minds, rather. Well, I didn't, I didn't dislike the physical part, but it seemed like it was missing an important element. What important element was it missing? Um, the emotion and, like I said, just the mental connection some kind of being on the same page, so to speak. So you, you didn't feel, as you were leaving, you didn't feel any kind of emotional connection or like you had grown closer with Mr. Alexander. Is that what you're telling us? I didn't feel like we'd grown closer. Um, he seemed more distant. Okay. How did you feel in retrospect about the sexual behavior you engaged in with Mr. Alexander. Do you feel okay? Was it still too far too soon? It didn't feel like too much too soon anymore because over that month we had really gotten to know each other very well. Um, I developed feelings for him and it just seemed, it was confusing though, even though it wasn't, it was a little confusing, the um, sex. What do you mean? What was confusing about it? Well, I mean, I guess just where the, where the line should be drawn, I guess. And what do you mean by, by line? Your line, the, uh, the vow of chastity, what kind of line are you, t are you speaking of? Well, to me, um, sex is sex. There's just different ways to have sex, and it seemed like it seemed like Travis was kind of um, I don't know how to put it, um, but it just seemed like he sort of had like the Bill Clinton version, whereas over here it seemed like you know oral and anal sex were also sex to me, but not for him and the line that you're talking about, that line of demarcation really sounds like that that dealt with the vow of chastity. Is that accurate? Yes. Yeah. When you were reflecting back on the weekend and your way back to Palm Desert, uh, did you consider your actions, and your own, not his, but your own actions as it relates to that vow of chastity? I considered it. And how did you feel about that? Well, I trusted what I was told by him, so I didn't feel like we were sinning. I just felt, I felt a little bit, I hate to put it this way, but I felt a little bit used. Um, but I, I knew I had gone there on my own willingly. What do you mean, though, that you've, you've felt used? Well, you know, he gets a hotel room, I show up, we hang out, we have sex. He's not really there presently, like, he's not mentally present. Um, 
I'm getting a lot of attention, but only while we're engaging in sexual activity. And then we check out and he takes off. And, and I kind of felt like, like a prostitute, sort of. You didn't feel real good about the relationship or how he treated you at that point, right? I was more upset with myself. I didn't feel like he mistreated me, but I didn't feel like he was treating me as well as he had been for that entire life. Okay. Do you hear from, you, you discussed earlier uh, what was seemingly near daily contact with Mr. Alexander on the phone in the evenings. Did you speak with him that, that Saturday evening when you got back home? No, I called him later, but we did not, he didn't return my call. When, after, did you hear from him on Sunday? No, I called him one more time Sunday evening, left a voicemail, and he didn't return my call. Was that abnormal for him not to return your call? Um, maybe one night, not really. Um, I did want to know if he made it home safely. Um, but I'm, I wasn't trying to be his mother, but I was concerned about if he made it home, made it back safely. Um, Sunday night, he usually, he began to call me very late at night by this point. So I just, I would leave a voicemail if I was going to sleep. And sometimes he wouldn't call me back if I told him I had to sleep. Sometimes he would call anyway and wake me up. But by Monday morning, when he had not returned both of my calls, um, well, let, let me let me back up a step and ask you this: You said on Saturday you're driving home, you're feeling used. You call him Saturday night, you don't get a return call. How are you feeling Sunday or about the weekend? Are you feeling the same way? Have your feelings changed on um, Sunday before? Not, they hadn't really changed. I wasn't. I was trying not to think about it much or put too much thought into it or overanalyze it. After feeling the way you did on Saturday when you came back, when you were driving back and, and feeling the same way Sunday, why would you want to speak with him at all? I just had feelings for him. Were you in love with him at that time? I wouldn't say in love, but I had warm feelings for him, still sort of in the crush realm, but a little stronger, I'd say. So those feelings for him were more prominent than your feelings for yourself about being used. Is that what you're telling us? Yes, we Let me answer. Can you repeat that question? I'm sorry. You told us a few moments ago how you felt used as you were driving back from Ehrenberg. But you also told us that you had feelings for Mr. Alexander, and that's why you were reaching out to him on Saturday evening and Sunday evening. What I'm asking you is if your feelings for Mr. Alexander were stronger than your feelings for being used. Yes, they were. When you did not hear from him over these two days, did your feelings, how did your feelings about being used, did they become stronger, did they become weaker? Um, I think I began to think, well, I sent him a text message on Monday, so by that time he still didn't return any of those three attempts. So by that point, I was beginning to think that I had been very stupid and he got what he wanted and he wasn't interested in me anymore. When you started feeling like stupid and he got what he wanted and he wasn't interested in you anymore, were you then in a position that you wanted to write him off or were you in a position where you wanted to hear from him? I can't say really either. I just, I wasn't thinking of writing him off. Um, I think if he was moving on, I would have liked to at least have known. 
you know. Okay. When did you get a response, if at all, from Mr. Alexander? Um, it would have been Tuesday evening. I was at a business briefing, and he called during the middle of that, and I didn't hear my phone because it was turned off, or the volume was, the ringer was turned off. And so I checked afterward, and he had called and left me um, a very nice voicemail. Did you wind up talking with Mr. Alexander after he left the voicemail? Yes, I called him after the meeting. Did the... I want to know what he said, but did your conversation with him then make you feel less like you were used when you were in Aranbur? Yes, it was more reassuring. He wasn't reassuring me, but the nature of the call was reassuring to me. Did you ever uh, express your feelings to him about how you felt used when you were driving home? No. What was that? No. Why not? I didn't want to make him feel bad. Um, I also was telling myself that maybe that was just all in my head and that's, you know, I was misinterpreting it or overanalyzing it and it wasn't that big of a deal. So it sounds like after this phone conversation you have on Tuesday, everything is, is back to, to status quo in terms of your feelings towards Mr. Alexander. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. Do these phone calls we heard about, about these long spiritual conversations, do they then begin again after this call on Tuesday? Yes, the same routine, the same subject matters. And those subject matters being more spiritual, or were they also sexual? They were spiritual, sexual, and other things. When do you recall seeing Mr. Alexander next? Uh, the, I think it was right before Thanksgiving. And you recall the reason for that um, meeting with him? He was on his way to Riverside, where he was going to spend Thanksgiving, and Palm Desert is on the way, so he stopped at my house and we hung out for a little while. Um, and then he continued on to Riverside. Now you were, when were you baptized into the Mormon Church? November 26th. So, uh, of what year? 2006. So this would have been, was this the, the and, and who baptized you? Travis baptized me. Okay. This visit you're mentioning, was that when he baptized you or was this a distinct visit? No, this was a distinct visit. It was right before Thanksgiving. Were you baptized before or after Thanksgiving? After Thanksgiving, I think, was on the 22nd that year. Well, the 26th would have been on a Sunday, so whatever the previous Thursday would, was. Okay. This meeting, then, was at your home in Palm Desert? Yes. I think it was the day before, on the Wednesday. Okay. The day before Thanksgiving? Yes, right, right before Thanksgiving, so probably Wednesday. Okay. Uh, and where did you wind up meeting him? He came to my house with his dog. Uh, was Daryl still living in the house at this time? I think Daryl was still living in the house, but he was at work. Okay. So tell us uh, about what, what happens when he arrives at, at your home. Well, this was the first time he, was, he had seen my house, so I just walked him around the property. Briefly, it's not a big property, but he wanted to see the pool. Um, 
he, his dog jumped in the pool and sank right to the bottom. So that was scary. I guess pugs don't swim. So um, he jumped in with his clothes and everything on to save his dog. And I took him and we put him inside so he wouldn't do that again. Um, so Travis was soaking wet at that point. So he took a hot shower because in November the pool is freezing. And um, I threw his clothes in the dryer so that they would dry off and warm up. And we were intimate again, and then we said goodbye. You said intimate. How were you intimate? Um, I don't recall exactly. It would have been oral sex or the grinding. Again, that's all we were doing at that point. Okay. During this particular encounter, Did he again ask you to have anal sex with him? Yes. But no anal sex took place during that, on that day? No, it was more like teasing and I said no. Did he ejaculate? Yes. And after he ejaculated, he left? Shortly thereafter. Your Honor, may I approach? I want to show you what has been marked as Exhibits 393 and 394. Be so kind as to take a look at those. Do you recognize those? Yes. What are those pictures of? Those are pictures of Travis's erection. And when did you, or how did you... Uh, come into possession of these photos? They were sent to me. How? Uh, via his phone. Via a, a text message or picture message? Picture message. Okay. His phone and my phone. Your Honor, I'm going to move to admit exhibits 393 and 394. Should I just lack the foundation if we could get a date on it? The stain? Ms. Harris, would you like to see the photos again in terms of the day that they were received? I think I remember the day. Well, let, let me have you take a look then and see if you can tell us the day that they were received. Do you recall now? Yes. Does that date on the photo reflect the date that you received it? Yes, that would have been a Saturday. And this was before he came to your home in Palm Desert? Yes. Your Honor, I would again move to admit Exhibits 393 and 394. Yeah, what's the date? Somebody could just announce it. It, um, Go ahead, Jody. What day was it that you received them? It was November 11th, 2006. I'm sorry. Do you? I can cut the exhibit. Okay. 393 and 394 are admitted. Permission to publish, Your Honor? Yes. And you said this came to you uh, via uh, phone message. Is this something that you had uh, solicited from him? Not directly. I didn't expect a photograph, but we were flirting. You were what? Flirting. That is a picture of his erection that he sent you, is that right? Yes. And you were saying you were flirting. What do you mean by flirting? Um, I was um, at, I was in Anaheim, at the Anaheim Grove, and I was at a Super Saturday for that area. And I was listening to the speakers, and we began to text, and... I was, we were just text messaging back and forth. Um, we, it kind of became, it turned flirty and then it turned sexual and it went on for hours actually, just back and forth, just trying to be witty and top each other's last comments. And in that regard, in order to top your last comment, he sent you this picture? It, that actually culminated at the restaurant after we left the Grove. Oh, he wasn't there. He was in Mesa. 
um, I was with other people. So we were at the restaurant when my phone beeped. I didn't know, I, didn't, I hadn't received pictures on that phone before. So when I opened, I showed I had a message from him and I opened it and I couldn't find it. And then I realized it was a file that I had to, I don't know if I had to open it or go into a different folder to see it. And then I realized what it was. And I, I shut my phone really quick. It was a flip phone. And moving, uh, I was just showing you for the record, 393. And then 394. It appears these are different photos. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, they're different. So we sent you two photos that day? Yes. Consecutively. All right. Miss Arias, when he did that, was he also requesting that you reciprocate with any photos? Yes. Did you reciprocate with photos? No, not that day. Why not? I was at a restaurant and um, I, I don't know how to really explain it without well, did you, saying. Did you want to reciprocate? Not, no, I didn't, but I knew he wanted to, so I was a little bit conflicted, but I said no. How did he react to your um, refusal to send him a picture? He, he felt it should be fair, kind of like that. Like, he didn't say that, but he had been requesting photos for a while at this point, and. What, what was he requesting photos of? Um, naked pictures. Of you? Yes. Of particular body parts, or, or did he make any specific requests? No, he didn't specify body parts right, that I remember. Okay. Up to the point in time when you received this picture, these pictures of his erection, you had not sent him any pictures, is that right? Yes. After the point in time, and I don't want to get too far down the road in the story, but after the point in time that he sent you those pictures, did you then feel a level of guilt for not reciprocating? Yes, I didn't want to disappoint him. I felt like I had disappointed him. And he seemed very disappointed. Anyway. Okay. Now, I want to spend some time talking about, did you say your baptism took place on November 26 of 2006? Is that right? Yes, that's right. Okay. We, we heard a little bit from Mr. Freeman about the process, but I want to hear about what, what you went through um, leading up to it, okay? Would I like to discuss that now? Okay. okay. Do you remember a particular point in time, maybe a month, a year, that you decided you wanted to join the Mormon faith? Um, it was a series of experiences that brought me to make that decision, ultimately. Describe for us what you mean by series of experiences. Well, the first, the first week the missionaries came, they invited me to church that following Sunday. Um, this time I'd actually slept, so I was able to pay attention to what was being said. And 
someone was giving a talk and what that person said was very impactful and something that I had not heard um, other Christians embrace before, but it was something that I personally embraced. And I like. what, what was it, that, if you recall? Am I allowed to say what he said? Well, just tell us the general subject subject matter of. It was um, it was an acceptance and a tolerance of all faiths in the world, basically. And you found that aspect of the Mormon faith to be in line with your own personal beliefs, right? Yes. Okay. Describe for us, then, you were talking about these experiences, a series of experiences. What other experiences led you to believe or led you to choose to be baptized into the Mormon faith? The more, Travis and I talked about the church a lot, and I asked him any questions I had. I asked the missionaries also, but I was able to ask Travis a few more questions on a personal level. And um, not necessarily a sexual level, but just things that I wasn't comfortable asking two 20-year-old guys. So um, um, the more that I discovered about the church, the more I realized that it did not conflict with my beliefs, and it, it was in alignment with a lot of the values that I had, and especially the family values and the, the emphasis they place on families and marriage and the importance thereof and um, I didn't like the no coffee rule I, I almost I couldn't imagine giving up coffee at that point I drink it every morning and sometimes in the evenings um, but that was the only thing that bothered me there was no alcohol but I wasn't really a drinker anyway so that didn't bother me but just everything seemed to line up for me as far as my beliefs and the lifestyle that I was that I was interested in leading once you made this decision internally in terms of wanting to be baptized um, how do you move from how did you move from that point in time to November 26 when you were actually baptized was there a process you went through with the church. Could you just kind of explain that to us? Yes. Um, the missionaries finally asked me if I was ready to be baptized, and I told them yes. So they set up an interview with another young man. I think he was an elder. And he asked me a series of questions. It's like a, an interview that you have right before you're baptized to see if you're ready to be baptized. And when did this interview, if, if you know the date, fine. If not, relative to when you were baptized, when did this interview take place? It was sometime in November, but I don't remember the exact time. It was close to my baptism date. Okay. As it relates, well, let me ask you this. What sort of subjects uh, were... What sort of questions were you asked? What were the subject matter of the questions that you were asked uh, during this, this pre-baptismal interview? So long ago, I don't remember the exact questions, but they were, they asked um, questions about your belief in Jesus Christ and the veracity of the Book of Mormon and um, about your belief in Joseph Smith being a prophet of God and if you have been obeying the word of wisdom, which is the, um, the coffee and tea, etc. And if you've been obeying the law of chastity, which to my understanding at that time was, I guess, different. Um, let, me, let me ask you about that. You said you were asked if you are obeying the law of chastity, right? You were asked that during the interview? Yes. Okay. Um, and your understanding of the law of chastity was uh, abstaining from penile vaginal intercourse. That, that's what your understanding was, is that correct? Yes. Okay. So when you were asked that question, your 
based on your understanding, you believe that you were indeed in line with the vow of chastity. Is that accurate? Or? Yes. In a technical sense, I believed I was. Okay. And that belief was based on the things that Mr. Alexander was telling you? Yes. So after this interview, what happened? Are you approved to be baptized? What is the, what is the process from that point on? Um, I wasn't approved right away because I told the person that, that Daryl still lived in the house. And so he said he'd have to check um, since he was an ex-boyfriend and he's the opposite sex. And that's discouraged in the church to live under the same roof as somebody of the opposite sex who's not family or not your spouse. So he checked and then I interviewed, I think, with another, I think it was the branch president, just to check. And he wanted to make sure that we were in separate bedrooms and that that wasn't going to be an ongoing living situation. And Daryl had plans to move in about another week and a half or two weeks back to Monterey. So we were going to postpone the baptism, but the branch president said that he feels that the baptism should go forward as scheduled instead of postponing it till after Daryl moved. Okay. And it was scheduled for the 26th? Was that the original day it was scheduled for? Yes. Okay. So you get this um, approval, I guess. Um, how, many, how many days beforehand do you, do you get the approval versus the day you're actually baptized? I would say roughly a week. I don't remember exactly. It wasn't, it was close to the date. Okay. So you were aware of your impending baptism when Mr. Alexander came to visit you at your home? Yes. Okay. I believe I was. Okay. How was, who, who baptized you into the Mormon faith? Travis baptized me. How was that decision made that he was to be the person to baptize you? Um, well... When I decided I was going to get baptized, there was a period in early November, I think, or maybe it was mid-November, Travis had been a little more distant again. So I was kind of questioning where we were going with things on that. I still wanted to get baptized. And um, when I asked the missionaries, well, when they had told me if I would ask me if I was ready and I told them yes, I asked if his name was Elder Jensen. I asked if he would do it because he had, second to Travis, he had taught me so much about the church at that point. And he had said that it's better. It's not being offered for the truth of the matter, so did. Rephrase the question. Did he accept your invitation to, to baptize you? He did. No, he didn't accept it. He didn't. Objection. To your understanding, why not? I don't recall exactly what he said, but he encouraged me to find somebody. I don't recall exactly what he said. I remember the essence of it, and that was that he encouraged me to find somebody, not him or his partner, not one of the missionaries. Apart from then, from those individuals and Mr. Alexander, at this point in time, did you have a close relationship with uh, any other members of the church that would be, that would have the ability to baptize you? Not a close relationship. I had acquaintances and, and nobody really in that area except the small branch. I didn't hang out with them too much at that point. So not really. So how did you then come to the point in time that you decided that you wanted Travis to baptize you? He was the only other person I could think of. Um, and he was the person that I was initially thinking of also. So I decided to go ahead and, well, he asked me first if I was had decided whether or not I was going to be baptized. 
And I told him yes, and he said that's great. Is that your hearsay as the conversation? Okay, sorry. Mr. Alexander was happy to learn that you were being baptized? He was happy to learn that, yes. Did you then invite him to baptize you? Yes. Do you recall when you made uh, that invitation? I don't, it would have been November. I don't remember the exact date. Did this happen in person or did this happen over the telephone? It was over the phone. Okay. Where did your baptism take place? In Palm Desert. What was involved, well, just describe for us uh, your baptism. Is it just you and Mr. Alexander or are there other people involved? No, um, many people were invited. I think it's open to anyone attending, especially church members. Um, Non-members are encouraged to attend also. Um, Travis, um, I don't remember if he invited them or if I invited them, but the Hughes came out. Um, a few other people in the business that were church members came to my baptism. Did you invite uh, your family? No, they lived 11, 12 hours away, so I didn't. I told them. Objection, here's a question. She was asked whether she invited them. Sustained. You didn't invite them. Were you under the impression that they wouldn't have an interest in being there? Well, I mean, if they could teleport there, they'd be there, but they certainly wouldn't make the effort to come out there for that event. Prior to you being baptized, had your family expressed misgivings about you joining the church? Yes. We say your family... Are we talking about the immediate family, your, your, your parents, your grandparents, uh, and your brothers and sisters? Yes, aunts, parents, siblings, and friends. So pretty much everyone in your, from what you're telling us, it sounds like pretty much everyone in your immediate circle um, discouraged you from joining the church? Yes. Did you invite Mr. Brewer to attend? Yes. Did he attend? No. So tell us what, uh, well, the, you, you mentioned the ceremony. Were you, how did you feel that day knowing that you were going to be baptized before the ceremony? I was a little nervous because I didn't know what the process entailed, but I was excited. And how was the, tell us, tell us what occurred uh, during your ceremony. Um, well, we had chairs set up and a small podium in another room, not in the main chapel, um, but it's still at the church building. And People took their seats, there were some hymns, well, we opened with a prayer, there were some hymns that we sang, and a few talks that were given um, on a few different subjects. And I don't remember if another hymn was sang, but then I was led into the font, I went into the back, and then Travis was already in the font. What's, you said the font, what is the font? Um, the best I can describe it is a, a very big, like a giant bathtub, but filled with water about waist level when you're standing up. Okay. And you said Mr. Alexander was back there. What takes place when you go towards the font? Um, well, before entering the font, I changed into um, an all-white, kind of like a jumpsuit. Um, and then there's some steps that lead into the font. And what happens when... What happens when you go into the font? It was a lot like Dan described. You walk up and um, 
Travis held his hand up and said some kind of invocation or prayer or blessing. I don't know what it's called. Um, he made a declaration, so to speak, and then I was dipped into the water and came back up. And how did it feel for you to be baptized? Were you elated? Did you feel very spiritual? Can you describe that feeling? It was a very peaceful feeling. Now, after the official baptism, the, rit the, the ritual you just talked about, after that is over, are there more services? Is there a reception? For those of us who aren't familiar, could you please just kind of take us through that experience? Are you talking about what happens after the baptism? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I went back into the designated area, I guess, where for the ladies, where they can change. Um, I changed, was changing into my clothes. Um, Sky Hughes came into that area to see, to check on me. Um, after that, we went back into the main area where everybody was still hanging out and just talking about whatever, just plans for the week, things like that. Um, I think we might have closed with a prayer, but I don't remember. I just remember everything sort of dispersing after, shortly after I was out of the water. Okay. And how did you get back home that day? That day, I I drove. Okay. Did you drive by yourself? No, Travis came with me. Okay. Tell us what happened when you got back to the house. Um, we got back to the house. His car was parked at my house, so we took my car to church. So we got back to the house, um, went inside, and we hugged, um, words were exchanged. What happened after you hugged and, and words were exchanged? Um, we began to um, kiss and things got um, intimate again. Was that place of intimacy a place you were thinking about going on this spiritual day? Not how it ultimately happened, no. What do you mean, how it ultimately happened? Describe for us what happened after you and Mr. Alexander started kissing that, that day. Um, well, we were in my bedroom. We were not on the bed, but we were standing next to it. And we were kissing. And... I was in my church clothes. He was in his church clothes. Um, the kissing got more passionate and more intense, and then he spun me around. And um, he bent me over the bed, and he was just on top of me. I didn't think anything was, but he was just going to keep kissing me. What happened when he bent you over the bed? Were you face down on the bed or face up? I was face down. My head was turned inside. And what happened? His hands were wandering um, and he lifted up my skirt and, and he pulled down my underwear. And he was pressing against me. What do you mean pressing against you? His whole body. Did he have an erection? I could feel an erection. And what happened next? Um, he unzipped his pants and I guess he pulled it down. I didn't see. But he, um, he began to have anal sex with me. And you said that he had anal sex with you. Based on what you said before, 
this wasn't something that you were expecting to happen? No, not that night. Is this something that you wanted to happen? Well, I can't say I wanted to, but I didn't stop him. When he entered you, you said you didn't stop him. Did you say anything? Did you tell him no? No. Was it pleasurable for you physically? At that time it was painful, somewhat. Well, given that it was painful, why didn't you tell him no? Eventually I did. I, I probably would have just let him continue, but it was became too painful. Why do you say you probably just would have let him continue? Because I knew that is what he had been wanting for, for a while. And I just, I, I trusted him. I had a lot of trust and he, I just went with what he was, with his agenda, I guess I could say. This agenda you describe him having and this pain you were experiencing, did this go on for several minutes before you told him no? I don't think it went on too long, not several minutes, maybe a few. And from what you're telling us, it sounds like the only reason that you told him no or told him to stop was the pain, not your lack of interest in this activity. Is that right? That's pretty accurate. I mean, I wasn't looking forward to it, but definitely the pain, I had to. I had to have him stop. Otherwise, I probably would have continued. Otherwise what? I probably would have continued if it weren't for that. Okay. After he stopped, was that um, the end of the intimacy that day? Um, he, he finished um, by ejaculating on my back or somewhere, like on me. Um, and then we were finished. And then shortly, I mean, I think we parted ways, we kissed and embraced and he left. After this encounter on this spiritual day, how did you feel about yourself? Um, after he left, shortly after he left, I felt, I didn't feel very good. I kind of felt like a used piece of toilet paper. <laughs> Um, I don't know, I didn't, I didn't continue feeling that way, just shortly thereafter for a little while I did. And then in late November of 2006, after your baptism, does Mr. Alexander stay in Palm Desert? To your knowledge, or does he, does he go back? He drove back to Mesa, to my knowledge. Okay. You need a moment? No. Thank you. After this incident on the 26th, when was the next time you spoke with Mr. Alexander? I can't remember if it was that night or the next night, but it was shortly after that. Did the subject of the 
encounter the uh, anal sex you just described? Did that come up in your conversations? Um, he wrote me a letter about it. We didn't discuss it directly on the phone. We had discussed things of that nature in the past. Um, Did you ever voice your displeasure uh, with the incident to him? Only when I said. She's the declarant judge. Overruled, you may answer. I kind of just said through clenched teeth, stop, 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 and he stopped. So I think he got the impression that it was not pleasurable at that point, but I never said anything about it after that of a negative nature. So you never advised him that you felt like, uh, as I think you said, a used piece of toilet paper. You never advised no, him that. I wouldn't have told him that. You would not have? Is that no. what you said? Why not? Because um, I don't think that would have made him feel very good. How about how you felt? I was dealing with that, you know. So after, after this incident, you say you talked to him. Are you talking to him then again on a near daily basis or near nightly basis? Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Yes. And you mentioned these phone calls getting progressively later and later. What time are we talking about a, a majority of these phone calls taking place? He almost stopped calling me completely before 11 o'clock, 11 p.m. Usually it was closer to midnight, and sometimes it was as late as 3 a.m. Um, he would call and we would talk. These talks now you mentioned in the past that they were of a spiritual nature, personal nature, and a sexual nature. Did that pattern persist in, in throughout November? Subsequent, yes. I should say November, December, subsequent to this incident. Yeah, new subject matters were incorporated um, regarding our futures. Things like that. But for the most part, that same kind of thing continued. Well, let me, let me ask you this. You say regarding the future. Did that future, was that related to uh, the relationship prospects between yourself and, and Mr. Alexander? Yes. Prior to... Let's even make it specific to November 26th. Uh, were you and Travis boyfriend and girlfriend? No, we were not. When did you, for the sake of discussion now, when did you become boyfriend and girlfriend? We became boyfriend and girlfriend. Well, we didn't term it that, but we became... Not initially, we became exclusive, to my understanding, on February 2nd, 2007. Okay. So it was a good two, three months later after this incident before you became exclusive of boyfriend and girlfriend? Or yes. Okay. Now, as it relates to these times, and I, and I wanna back up a little bit, when you were in public with Mr. Alexander prior to November 26th. Did you act publicly as if you were boyfriend and girlfriend? No, not in public. What about during the trip to Ehrenberg? I mean, were you holding hands? Did you have your arm around each other? Was that different than most of the other times? Inside the motel room, definitely. Um, inside the truck stop 
there's the restaurant is adjoins this mini mart, and he um, he grabbed my butt there. There were some men standing by, and he did that right in front of them. And other than that, I think he wasn't too affectionate a sizzler. I don't really remember, but he was very affectionate inside the motel room while we were being physical. Okay. As you were having this, what was the beginnings of a sexual relationship? You've had these few sexual encounters. Were you under the impression that this was something that was supposed to be kept a secret? I got that impression from different things, different hints and clues and things that his friend said. Okay. Is, would that be, without directly saying what they're saying, would that be directly related to the vow of chastity and Travis's, the belief that Travis was adhering to it? I don't know. I believed that we were adhering to it. Okay. It was not, sorry. So even at the point in time when you had this unwanted anal sex, hmm. you believed you were complying with the vow of chastity? By definition. It didn't really feel that way, but by definition I did believe that. In that regard then, there must have been some reason why you felt like you couldn't tell anybody about these encounters, right? Yes. And what was that reason? I don't typically talk about my sex life with people. That was pretty much the simple reason. Did Mr. Alexander know that? Um, he knew I was discreet. I didn't reveal anything about Daryl. Okay. Did he ask? In the beginning, he joked about it, um, but he didn't press for too many details. I didn't give him any. Okay. So after November 26th, when, and you're still living in Palm Desert, right? Yes. And Travis is still living in Mesa, right? Yes. Okay. And it sounds to me like in this point in time in the story, you hadn't come to visit him in Mesa. Is that correct? Yes, I'd never been to Arizona. Okay. Let's talk about then the next time you saw Mr. Alexander. When was that? It was about, um, it was the Friday following the Sunday I was baptized. And where did that um, meeting take place? At his house. His house in Mesa? Yes. Okay. And what was, the, what was the plan? Were you coming out there for a weekend? Were you coming out there for a long time? What was the idea, the purpose of the visit? There was another uh, regional event happening, a Super Saturday in Phoenix, with a special guest speaker that was flying in. Um, was really big in the company. So a ton of people were carpooling, uh, caravanning out from California, and I was part of the caravan. And we all think there were three or four vehicles. They were coming from Paris, um, California, Moreno Valley, Marietta, other Southern California towns, and Palm Desert is on the way, so that was the last stop where I met them at Carl's Jr., and we all got on the road and drove together for the most, most of the drive. Okay. When you, uh, in this, this event um, in Mesa, I'm assuming this wasn't at Mr. Alexander's home, is that right? The event? Yeah. No, it was in Phoenix. Okay. Uh, so you caravan, you, you carpool with these, these people from California you get to this meeting in Phoenix. Is this where you see Mr. Alexander at this meeting? No, we, st we went to his house first on Friday night. The event was Saturday morning. Okay. You say we. Who was we? Uh, me and 
Do you want me to name names? Well, no, that's okay. Just some of the people you were you were carpooling with. Yes, his friends and people that were in the company. What was the purpose of going to Mr. Alexander's house? Were you staying there? Could you just describe that for us? Yes, a bunch of people from out of state were coming to his house, and we were all going to crash there. Okay. And what were what were the sleeping arrangements to be? Um. Well, the sleeping arrangements after we got after we got there, he was. We were determining those things. Um, let me ask you this. Prior to, obviously, Mr. Alexander you knew you were coming out to this event, right? Yes. Um, did he give any indications to you that while you were in Mesa, and how many days was this going to be? Um, it's Saturday, and we would leave Sunday. Okay. Well, we arrived Friday night. Okay. So while you were in Mesa for this three-day weekend, I guess, did he give you any indication that he wanted to engage or have some sort of sexual interaction with you? No, it was just the opposite. Okay. Told you he didn't. Yes. Okay. So tell us uh, about that weekend then. It was yourself and others, did you wind up having a sexual encounter with Mr. Alexander that weekend? No, he joked about oral sex, giving him, um, but he was concerned about his ex-girlfriend there, and he didn't want us to be affectionate in front of her. And this ex-girlfriend, we heard from a girl by the name of Lisa, or then by the name of Lisa Andrews. Is that the girlfriend we're talking about? No, Lisa Andrews came after, or this was a girlfriend prior to Okay. Lisa. All right. And what was her name? Uh, Deanna. So he expressed to you uh, concern that Deanna would be jealous. He didn't say jealous. Did he express misgivings about how the two of you were to act in front of Deanna? Yes, he warned, he felt he needed to warn me. Warn you that what? We're going to take the noon recess at this time. Ladies and gentlemen, please be back in the jury room at 125. Please remember the admonition. Have a nice lunch. You are excused. Please be seated. The record will show the jury has left the courtroom. Yes, Ms. Sirius, you may step down. Let's address the last objection. Mr. Martinez. Martinez. She was going to talk about what Mr. Alexander told her. That's hearsay. You know, hearsay has a much more complex definition than um, just the fact that somebody comes out of the, uh, something comes out of someone else's mouth. Uh, that does not hearsay make. It has to be an assertion, intended as an assertion by the by the uh, declarant that is offered for the truth of the matter asserted. Uh, this goes to Ms. Arias' state of mind as it relates to uh, how she was to act in front of this uh, girlfriend, Deanna. Uh, it goes to the effect of the listener. I don't even think it's hearsay because it's not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted as to the reasons why that Mr. Alexander was concerned uh, about his conduct in front of Ms. Reed. That we're not going to the truth of the matter that the effect of how this affected Ms. Arias' conduct and the behavior that weekend. Right, as we discussed at the bench yesterday, if you can redirect her by rephrasing the question that is preferable, we'll limit the number of bench conferences we need to have. So just rephrase the question sure. when the jury returns. All right. Mr. Nermy, you wanted to make a record? Would you want to do that now? Well, yes, Your Honor, that's fine, but I believe um, I'd like to have the sheriff's Privately. office begin by addressing what they're requesting and, and then so I can make my objection to it. All right, Mr. Dutcher, on behalf of the sheriff. 
morning, Judge. Uh, Scott Dutcher on behalf of Sheriff Pompeo. Uh, come to the Sheriff's attention, there have been some conferences in, in chambers in a non-secure area of the, of the courthouse with Miss Arias present, and that's not something the Sheriff permits. I after we all discussed this uh, this morning before court began, I did uh, explore some other options with the Sheriff's Office and I know the defense has some concerns and this, this may be an option if, if everyone wants this. If there are uh, short conferences in as lieu of having everyone clear the courtroom, right over here is a secure area and there aren't chairs. I don't know if we can get some chairs, but if it's a short conference, we can all uh, enter this area of the courthouse, which is secure area of the jail and Everyone can, I guess, have them say whatever they need to say. I don't know if that's an option that everyone wants, but that that or the courtroom are the only options available, Judge. It is a security issue to have inmates in unsecure areas of the jail, and that's not something the sheriff allows for for any inmate, including Miss Harris. All right, and you wanted to make a record on that, Mr. Nunn? Judge, I, I just want to uh, recite at least, obviously, we know the Sixth Amendment guarantees my client's right to be present at uh, all vital stages of these proceedings, and any denial of that would be a denial of due process and reason uh, for mistrial. Um, in this regard, uh, obviously, based on whatever the reasons were when we were asking to do this, whatever party was, both parties have asked, and the court has understood that under those circumstances, with not going into what they are, um, that those were important. There were reasons for it. Uh, that is why some of those records have been sealed. So, Judge, I believe that, at least for the record, and our assertion is that, regardless, and, and I'm not trying to get in a, in a dispute with the sheriff's office, but Miss Arias is entitled to do that. I don't know about the viability from a, from a logistics standpoint of what the sheriff's office is suggesting, but I just want to make it clear for the record that we're asserting that she has an absolute right to be present, and if, if that needs to be facilitated in some way, either through clearing the courtroom or alternative means, and that, that is the basis of our assertion, and we will not waver on that point. If it gets more contentious in that regard, um, I would I would be asking for motions from the sheriff's office because again because this is such an important right. All right, the court will make the best determination it can in any given circumstance, including clearing the courtroom if necessary to accommodate a defense request or a confidential meeting. All right, uh, anything else? No, thank you. All right, for lunch. Thank you. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and counsel. Again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience. I'm sure you are accustomed to delays, and your patience is appreciated. Mr. Nermi, you may continue. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Harris, before lunch, we were talking about the time, uh, a weekend, uh, that you and some fellow members of Prepaid legal we're spending with Mr. Alexander, and that was at his home. Is that right? Yes. Okay. You were talking about, um, you mentioned an individual by the name of Deanna. Uh, did Deanna have a last name? Reed. Okay. And this Miss Reed, what was your understanding of who she was? My understanding um, was that she was an ex-girlfriend. Um, an ex-girlfriend of, of Mr. Travis. Alexander's? Yes, of Travis's. That she was somebody Travis had once been very serious with, um, that he was once in love with, and they were both in love, and they separated. Um, 
A lot of the history I know is through Travis. Okay. I mean, all of it, really. Okay. And well, that's his fine. Friends. Um, were you instructed to act a certain way uh, with Travis when Miss Reed was present? Yes. How was that? He warned me that she was um, emotionally unstable and that she would freak out if she saw him with other girls or if he attempted to move on any time he tried to date somebody. Did you see, I take it, um, and maybe I'm incorrect, was this the first time you met Miss Reed was in December 2006? It's the first time I saw her. I don't recall meeting her. He advised me to steer clear of her at his house. So I didn't, you know, seize the opportunity to go introduce myself or anything like that. Okay. This, these instructions, if you will, uh, that were given to you regarding Miss Reed, was that some sort of constant dictate throughout the course of your relationship with Mr. Alexander? Yes. The entire time, even after we eventually broke up. Okay. Because you weren't boyfriend and girlfriend in December 2006, correct? No, we were not. Okay. In that regard, you mentioned, um, and we'll, t we'll talk up into the, from the time you met Mr. Alexander to the time you were at his home in Mesa 2006 for the first time, uh, were you dating other people? There were, um, I was asked out on a few dates. Some I turned down and one I accepted during that time. Did Mr. Alexander know about these dates? Yes, he knew about, <clears throat> he knew about when I was asked and I think I did tell him. I don't remember, it was a church member. I don't remember if I told him. Okay. All right. Before we move past December 2006, based on what you're telling us earlier, there was no sexual interaction between you and, and Travis during this weekend. No, there were insinuations after everyone went to sleep, but he seemed almost paranoid that... Sorry. May we approach, Your Honor? We were talking about the fact that any, um, that no sexual interaction took place between you and Mr. Alexander, and you were explaining how he was paranoid about um, being caught. Is that right? Yeah, he seemed hyper vigilant about us having any physical contact, even just holding hands or hugging or anything like that. What do you mean, hyper vigilant? Did it? Did you hold hands and things like that, but he was paranoid people might see it, or can you describe that for us? Well, even after Deanna left and everyone, we found, all found our sleeping arrangements, Travis and I slept in the front room. He had two leather couches, uh, brown leather couches, and I slept on one and he slept on the other. Um, and there were other people sleeping in an adjacent family room, and then there were other people sleeping in the loft, and there were two ladies that were sleeping in his bed upstairs. Um, and it, even after all the lights were out and it was dark, um, we were laying on the couch talking and he had his hand laying like that, just off the couch, and I just put my hand out and just touched his fingers. You know, nothing erotic or anything, just being affectionate. And he, he kind of pulled away and sat up and looked around to see if, he could, if anyone was awake. And then he just kind of turned over toward me but didn't reach out anymore. So based on your interaction with him over the weekend, you were left with the impression that he certainly didn't want anyone to know that you were involved in, in any way. Objection, speculation. Rephrase. Based on this conduct when he pulls his hand away out of fear of being seen, did that leave you with the impression that Mr. Alexander didn't want people to know that you were in any way intimately involved with him? Objection, speculation. Maybe he didn't want to have sex with her. Uh, although, 
Yes. Were you there the weekend to have sex with Mr. Alexander? No, it was a business trip. I was excited to see him because I liked him, but no, definitely not for that. Were you hoping he might bend you over the bed and, and have anal sex with you? No. Now, you didn't have any physical or romantic contact with him this weekend because other people were there and he wanted to keep it a secret. That was your understanding. Yes, well, there was one romantic gesture as I was leaving. And where did that take place? He walked me out to my car to load up the bags, um, or my luggage, and his friend Chris was sitting in their um, Lexus SUV on the street, and he was on the phone facing, I guess they, we were in the driveway and he would have been facing west because he was parked up near the house. And my car was parked in the driveway. And after the trunk shut, he looked around and saw that Chris had his back to us and he was on the phone and he said, here, kiss me quick while no one's looking. And so we just kissed, not a, it was a brief kiss. Um, and that was it. And I, sorry. Okay. Well, let me ask you this. At this point in time, you had engaged in several, maybe a half dozen, maybe not quite a half dozen instances of sexual contact with Mr. Alexander, right? Yeah, well, how many did you say? Well, around a half dozen, give or, t give or take, probably a few Something less. Something close to that. Okay. And um, he doesn't want anyone seemingly to know that you have any sort of relationship in December 2006. So my question to you then is how did that make you feel? I didn't give it too much thought. It didn't make me feel good, but it didn't make me upset. I just sort of, it's something I kept ignoring and putting out of my mind and just ignoring. Okay. So you weren't mad at him? No. Did you ever think at this point in time, I'm done with this guy? Not, maybe not in the context that I think you're putting it. Okay. Well, what, what context was it then? I mean, at this point in time, you didn't say, gee whiz, we're doing all this activity. He doesn't even want to hold my hand in public. It's time to end this? It bothered me um, a little bit, but we talked about our, the status of our relationship the next day. And based on that conversation, use the word status, what was the, the status of your relationship based on this conversation? Your, to your understanding, what was the status? Um, after talking, I was encouraged to date other people. And, you know, we talked a moment ago about, uh, you know, how you didn't, you were asked out on one date or asked out on a few dates before December. At this point in time, when uh, you're going to Ehrenberg and all those things, were you of the mind that Mr. Alexander wasn't dating anyone else? I had that impression. I found out it was false. Okay. We'll talk about that in a bit. But in January of 2007, or after December 2006, excuse me, you said that you were uh, encouraged to date other, uh, other individuals. Yes. Was there a certain type of individual you were encouraged to date? Uh, yes, he wasn't specific that first time, but then he got more specific afterward. Okay. Let me ask you this. Did you go on dates? Yes. 
do you know, to your knowledge, did Mr. Alexander learn about these dates? Yes. And where were these, uh, you were in, is this in December or is this in January of the following year? I think um, it, it would have been January. And where, you're still living in Palm, I, I got the sense that maybe you were moved out of your Palm Desert home by then, is that? No, I stayed in Palm Desert until early May, I think. Okay. So you were back in, I, I, did these days take place in Palm Desert? No. Where did they take place? Pasadena. Okay. And was there one particular individual? Did you go on sev or, uh, several dates? I went on dates with two different individuals. Um, yeah, two official dates. Two actual dates. And you mentioned Pasadena. Uh, you weren't living there. Uh, why were these dates taking place in Pasadena? I had a doctor's appointment um, in Pasadena. So there was a guy that I had met. He was sitting next to me at the Super Saturday event, that the one that, that I was texting Travis at. And he was very lively, and he asked me out, not right away. It was He was talking to me, getting to know me during the event, and then said, um, I don't remember how he worded it, but maybe we should go out sometime. Um, and this Super Saturday that you met this particular individual, when did this take place? It would have been the same date as the photograph, so November 11th, 2006. And did this individual ask you out on the 11th of November 2006? Yes, but nothing confirmed or concrete. He just threw it out there and I said, okay, maybe sure, you know. Did you feel like it would have been at that point in time, considering your relationship with Mr. Alexander, that it would have been inappropriate for you to date this individual? Not just to date, I wouldn't have considered it inappropriate. Um, I don't think so. You would or wouldn't have? I would not have if it was just a date. Okay. So you run into this individual again down the road? Yes. You mentioned Pasadena. You have a date with this individual? We decide, we agreed to meet in Pasadena. Okay. And who was this person? His name is Abe Abdelhadi. And how many dates did you have with Mr. Abdulhadi? Just one. And you dated another individual, you said? I went on what I thought was what I thought was going to be a date. It turned out to be more platonic, and that was someone else. And who was that? His name is John. John what? Dixon. Okay. The so you said the date with Mr. Dixon was, if I heard you correctly, platonic, right? That, well, we, he asked, he invited me to get lunch. We got sushi, we chit-chatted, I didn't get any vibes or major chemistry. We were just friendly, so that's the impression I was left with. Okay. And uh, the date with Mr. Abduhadi, was that more... Or I should say, was that a less platonic situation? It developed into that, sort of, but, you know, um, I mean, I don't know. We were just on a date, so it was not, he wasn't as, um, I don't know how to put it. It was, it was different from the lunch date that I had. Did Mr. Alexander know of these dates? Yes. He didn't know prior, but okay. he knew afterward. Did you, how did he know? Did you tell him? Um, I didn't answer my phone that night. So, because I was, actually I went to hang out with John Dixon again, and it was again platonic. He wanted to show me. Sorry, I need to stretch why were you with John Dixon again? 
Um, he invited me over to show me clips from a movie he was directing. Um, and he just played some of those clips on his computer. Um, and we watched some clips from Pirates of the Caribbean. And that was it. I think we might have hugged when I left. I don't remember. And this, it was at this time, I believe you're telling us that Mr. Alexander called and you weren't able to take his call at that moment. Yes. Okay. Was he angry that you didn't respond to his call or weren't there to answer his phone call? He wasn't angry, just inquisitive. Okay. And that inqu inqu inquisition, if you will, led to uh, you describing the fact that you were with Mr. Dixon. Yes. And how did that sit with Travis? Um, he wasn't warmly received. He didn't appear to get angry, but he, I could tell he was upset in his, the way he was, in his tone, his, his mood changed. What about the date with Mr. Abduhadi? Um, how did he come to, how did Travis come to learn of that date? Same conversation because both of those dates were on the same day in Pasadena. Okay. Was his distaste um, for your date with Mr. Abduhadi, was it different than um, than that with John Dixon? She didn't say he was distasteful. She characterized it differently. Overruled. Can you say that question again? Sorry. I'm going to try. Was Travis angry about your date with Mr. Abduhadi? It appeared to me, or it seemed to me, it was over the phone, so I didn't see him, but from the tone of his voice, he seemed upset. Was that at a different level or different reaction than it was as related to Mr. Dixon? I think it was all sort of cumulative. Um, well, you mentioned the fact that as far as being in, encouraged to date, you said that there were certain people, eventually you thought it was, didn't matter what kind of person you were encouraged to date. Then you said later on, you were encouraged to date a particular type of person. So what I was asking, is there some difference between Mr. Abduhadi and Mr. Dixon that caused, to your understanding, extra anxiety with Mr. Alexander? Um, I think they were grouped the same because they weren't church members, and I was sort of reprimanded for that. By Mr. Alexander? Yes. So it wasn't that they, they being Mr. Dixon and Mr. Abduhadi, were different from each other. The problem was, from your understanding, was that they were both not church members, and Mr. Alexander wanted you to only date church members. Yes. I got to ask, at this point in time, you've encouraged to date, why would you care, or why would you allow Mr. Alexander to have any input on who you dated? I sort of felt that way when he said that. I'm thinking he can't tell me who to date. But he explained to me the importance of dating within the church, and it made sense to me, so I agreed with him. You what? I agreed with him. Okay. So based on this conversation with Mr. Alexander, then you agree to, to him uh, that you're not going to date outside the church. Is that what we're taking away from this? I agreed with what he told me.
Now, the time period we're talking about was January 2007, and you told us that you and Travis officially became a couple uh, in February of 2007, right? Yes. Okay. How did uh, it go from you dating other people, uh, him encouraging you to dating other people, to this um, relationship, this, this boyfriend and girlfriend label? Um, he was... A lot of things happened in that three-week period. Well, well let's, let's talk about that. What, what, what happened from your perspective to get you from dating other individuals to being Travis's girlfriend? Well, the first thing I did is um, he hung up on me that night. He was upset. And, and so it kind of jarred me a little bit. So I decided to write him an email. And um, I just, I don't know why, but I felt like I was cheating on him, even though he had told me to date other people. I felt guilty about it, and so I expressed that to him, um, and while I was writing the email, he sent me a text message. I don't know if I can say what it said. Well, you write in this email, and you're expressing your feelings. Do you ever send it? Yes. Without telling us what was said, did this get to, is, is this kind of discontent uh, that led to you two deciding, well, okay, that's it, we're gonna be a couple? Is that what you're telling us? Not in that moment. It was a process over a few weeks. Okay. But, but that sort of thing led you, that sort of disconnect or uh, feelings is what led you two to be a couple? I think it sort of started us on the path. Okay. To be more official. Okay. So now when you say you and Travis officially became a couple, what did, what did that mean? Was there some sort of agreement or you know you, you you sat down and said you're not going to date other people tell us about the day that you and Travis became a, a, a couple if you will um, I went out to his house that weekend well the, the first weekend of February um, we hung out we were watching I don't know if you're watching a movie we were on the internet we were just reading books we were just doing things in the house all day hanging out and we were reading, we were each reading our own books. Um, and we were sitting in this oversized chair next to his bed, just two of us squeezed into it. Well, let me ask you, that you um, where were you? In his bedroom. Okay. Um, what brought you to his home? And this is February. Do you remember the day? Not exactly, but it would have been the first. Or the second. Okay. Maybe the third. So you go to his house in early February. Why were you there? I mean, there must have been some discussion about you coming to visit him, I assume. Is that right? No, there wasn't, actually. Okay. Um, tell us how you came to um, see Mr. Alexander in early February. Well, um, that month, he showed up on my doorstep at 1.40 in the morning without warning. And that's when I met Dan Freeman. And so a few weeks later, I thought I would repay him in kind and surprise him as well. Okay, Be before we uh, fast forward back to February, we heard about Mr. Freeman coming to your door at 1.40 in the morning, as you just talked about, uh, and you and Travis went back to the bedroom. Is that is that accurate to your recollection? Yes. Mr. Freeman wasn't in that bedroom. Could you describe for us what happened in the bedroom while Mr. Freeman was outside of the door? 
We just made out. What do you mean, just made out? It didn't go very far. We were just kissing and playing around and just having fun. Okay. No oral sex? No. No anal sex? No. And your clothing stayed on? Yes. Okay. So after this, a few weeks later, you surprised Mr. Alexander in early February. Do you remember about what time you arrived in the home? I had to work that night, so I hit the road. I don't remember. I think it was around 2.30 or 3 in the morning. And you were coming from Palm Desert? Yes. Okay. So tell us what happened when you arrived. I pulled up to his house, and I was kind of excited the whole trip. I was like thinking, I mean, he thought it was hilarious when he came, so I thought it would be funny to do that. Could you, could you speak up a minute? I'm sorry. Um, but as I approached the door, I, I had doubts. I thought, I kind of felt stupid. I was like, what is he going to think if I'm showing up at his house at 3 o'clock in the morning? So I started to like go back and forth and waver, and then I walked back to my car, and then I stopped. I was gonna get all the way in the car and just go back, because okay. I felt silly. But I turned around and looked at the house one more time, and I noticed in the upper window there were lights flashing, like that was the lock where the, the screen would have been for the um, television or movies or okay. whatever. So somebody was awake, so I decided, okay, what the heck. So before I could change my mind, I went back to the front door and rang the doorbell. Okay. And who answered the door? Um, Travis and Napoleon. Okay. And Napoleon is his dog, right? Yes. Okay. I could hear him before anything else. What's that? I could hear him before anything else. He okay. was barking very loudly when the doorbell rang. Was, did Mr. Alexander appear to you to be happy to see you? Yes, he looked very surprised, and he had a big grin on his face. Okay. What happened after that? Did he let you in the home? How did that go? He um, pulled me into the house. It was cold out, so I was, it was February, so I had a jacket on with a hood. And he just stood there, kind of a similar reaction to me when he showed up, just dumbfounded, but happy, like, what the heck. And then his roommate came downstairs, and um, he, Travis, yanked the hood off my head and said, well, this is Jody. So. And uh, which roommate was that? Thomas Brown. Okay. So after you met Mr. Brown and introduces you in the way he does, what, what takes place? Uh, the three of us go upstairs and get comfortable on the love sex. They're like giant bean bags. Um, Travis and I took the center one, and then Thomas, I think, was on the other side. He would have been on my right. Okay. As far as, and now we're talking, I know, late in the night or early hours of the morning, um, what were your sleeping arrangements in Mr. Alexander's home? Well, based on the last time I was at his home and how he reacted, I told him, um, I told him, it's okay if you want me to sleep on the couch, I'm okay with that. And he balked and insisted that I stay in his bedroom with him. And did you end up spending the night in the bedroom? Yes. Did any sexual activity happen that night? Um, yes, it did happen that night and the next night. I'm sorry, and you said the next night? Yes. Okay. Uh, what happened that first night? I don't recall specifics. I just know that we were intimate. Um, the same kinds of things we had done before, nothing different. No, except we did the anal sex briefly, but there was none of that. Okay. Um, and at this point in time as well, you had had 
penile vaginal intercourse, Mr. Alexander, is no. that right? Okay. And did you stay the next day then? Yes. Uh, what did you do? What did you and Travis do? We hung out all day. Um, he was showing me um, a museum that had come through Phoenix recently. It was called Body World. Um, he was showing me that museum online, and it had just left town. Otherwise, we were. he wanted to go take me to see it, but it was gone. Um, so we just hung out at the house. I'm trying to remember if we left. I think we stayed at the house all day and hung out. Okay. So you don't recall going out to dinner, going out to movie, anything like that? Stay at home all day? No. We might have gone to grab a bite to eat, but I, I don't think so. Okay. And I know you talked about you spent the next night with him. Did any that day... Did any sexual activity happen that during that day? I don't think so. Okay. It was at night. Okay, so you spend all day there. Uh, are his roommates home? I don't remember if Thomas had to work or not um, during the day, but they were home. It was Thomas and I, can't, I think Aaron Dewey. Okay. When you were in front of the roommates, did he hold hands with you, put his arm around you, anything of that nature? No. Uh, we stayed in the bedroom a lot, but when we hung out downstairs, if the roommates were there, we were just regular, like friends. Okay. And I'm not, and I'm not talking from a sexual standpoint, but was he? otherwise physically affectionate or expressive with you when you guys were behind the closed doors of his bedroom? Yes. So you spent two nights there, uh, and you said this is the point in time that you became his girlfriend. What was the discussion then that got you to the point where you were to be his girlfriend. Am I allowed to say what was said? Well, what, did, did the two of you have a conversation? Yes. And what was the subject matter of that conversation? My dating life. And during that conversation, did Mr. Alexander express to you his desire that you not date other people? Yes. And how did you receive uh, that? Well, he, it was kind of a lighthearted conversation. I didn't know if he was joking or not because he was talking about my dating life but not his. So I looked at him like, what do you mean by that? And then he clarified and kind of laughed. You mentioned his dating life. Uh, did you inquire if he was dating anyone else? No, I didn't. Did he offer up any information that he might be dating someone else? Not during that conversation. He did later? He offered it up, him, uh, up himself? Yes, I later found out he was dating a girl named Chelsea around the Christmas time. And it also would have been the time, I think, that I might have been in December, there in December, but I'm not sure. It was close to Christmas. But this isn't something he volunteered to you at the time you were having this boyfriend-girlfriend talk, right? No. Okay. And I'm, I'm sorry, I think it was near Thanksgiving, actually, that they dated. I can't remember. It was the holiday. Okay. But they were separated by the time. I don't know. It's in his emails, so. Okay. Um, so this moment in time uh, that you became his girlfriend, uh, were you happy about that? Yeah, I felt pretty good about it. I was, I don't know, we had 
a lot of, we had made a lot of progress over the last three weeks because of some things that had happened uh, involving some other friends of his and he had seemed to really change and better himself and he was treating me very nicely and when we became what I believe was exclusive then it just seemed like a natural the natural next step what do you mean by some things that had happened with some friends of his what do you mean by that um Without telling me specifically what was said. Um, Travis is, um, he was a funny guy and he would make jokes a lot. And he made some jokes toward me that were not very nice, but they were jokes, but still didn't sit well with me. So I expressed that with some of his friends when we were hanging out. And um, they advised me to it's not being offered for oh. the truth of matter asserted. Okay. They advised me to stop dating him immediately. These jokes, you you characterize them as jokes. What do you mean? What would he say to you? Um, he called me a skank. In front of other people? In front of his roommate, Josh Ward. And he thought that was funny? He, I didn't react, and he said, I'm just kidding, very quickly. He calls you a skank in front of a, a roommate of his. Why not just hightail it out of there? We were on the phone, actually, when he said that. We were talking, and then he began to have a conversation with somebody else, so I waited. And then he apologized. He said, sorry, Josh just got home. I said, tell him, tell him I said hi. Jody says hi. And I could hear a muffled response in the background. It sounded friendly, but Travis said, he said, you're a skank. So I knew that came from Travis, not Josh. And then he said, I'm just kidding. So at that point, I didn't really know what to say. I just kind of, in a polite way, got off the phone with him. And then the conversation with his friends ensued because I was at their house when that phone call took place. <coughs> You mentioned a couple other things. Did he, did he call you other names in a supposed joking manner? Yes. Facts, not in evidence. Josh Ford called her a skank. She interpreted that to be for Mr. Alexander. Judge, that's not accurate to what he said. These objections are inappropriate, Judge. Not what she testified. Restate your question. Overruled. Did Mr. Alexander call you? other names besides skank in a joking manner? Yes. What were they? He called me Pollyanna. He called me porn star. Um, in front of people? Pollyanna, yes, porn star, no. Okay. And what did he, what was the point of calling you Pollyanna? At the time, I had long platinum blonde hair, and um, I think because my demeanor at that time was kind of happy-go-lucky, positive, shrug things off if they were negative, um, I always looked at the bright side of things. That's kind of how I expressed myself. So with that demeanor plus my blonde hair, and he wanted to have braids um, sometimes, so I, he gave me that nickname. But he would call you Pollyanna in front of uh, your friends as well? Yes. You mentioned that he referred to you as a skank, and this set off somewhat of a conversation uh, with some friends of his about how he treated you, right? Yes. And in your mind, you said he was treating you better, so you felt as if these issues had been resolved and you were getting closer. The issue was, like the can of worms was opened when that happened, when he called me that, and then I voiced my concerns about it, sort of opened up um, a can of worms, I guess. Open up a well, did it open up a dialogue that ultimately led to this resolution, I guess? 
Yes, it did. Okay. So you are early February, your boyfriend and girlfriend, these issues have been spilled out on the table and resolved, so to speak. The, are you happy? Uh, that day, yes. Okay. It was nice. When you became his girlfriend, did the way he interacted with you in public, did that change? Around Dan and Desiree Freeman and I think his roommate Aaron Dewey, yes. But everyone else, no. Okay. So you're telling us that he, you felt as it, well, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Was he treating you as a girlfriend in front of these people and not in front of, in front of others? Is that what you're telling us? Yes. You made the comment that you were happy for that day. Did something change rapidly to make you not so happy? Um, yes. What happened? He got up, uh, we had been looking at the Body World Museum and we we're looking at all these different um, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but all these different body parts, and it was fascinating, just the human body and um, the structure and the organs and all of that. And after a while of clicking around on that website, he got up and um, started straightening out his room and doing some things, and I was looking at the website. And some of the things we had looked at, we went over quickly, and I wanted to look at them again, so I clicked the back button and until I was found what I was looking for kept clicking back, 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 and then I clicked back one too many times, and I was suddenly in his MySpace account. And what did you see there? Um, well, at first I was confused. I thought, I wonder why he didn't log out. So, um, I didn't see anything in it immediately, but he was in, it, it was the inbox, and I, the temptation got the better of me, so I clicked on an email. And was there a particular reason a certain email got your attention? Yes. Why? In early December, one day I logged on to MySpace, and I don't know if you're familiar with MySpace, but the friends in your network, you could see when they're online, because there's a little icon that flashes online now, or online or something. I don't remember, um, but I saw Travis was online too, so I clicked on his page to wish him good morning or good afternoon or whatever time of the day it was. And I noticed um, there were a ton of new comments on his page. And they were all from two women and they were, they were like, I, they were, I don't know what the computer term is, but they were graphics, they were, it was like graphic art, it was all very flirty, like, lips and sparkly hearts and all these kind of suggestive things. Um, so I thought that was interesting because, you know, we hadn't had the discussion yet about moving on or dating other people. This was right before that. And um, right then I got a phone call from him and he could see that I was online. And he began to tell me about this crazy experience he had, and it involved this. Um. Well, let, let, me, let me stop you here just for a second so we're clear. This wasn't after you became his girlfriend. This was a time uh, that you had seen his page previous to that from contacting him, right? Will you say that again? I'm sorry. I ask you what drew your attention to the particular email that you opened up the day after you oh, became his girlfriend. because um, I noticed that it was the same girl that, well, because he spun a story about it, and when you reply on an email, it says the RE with the colon, 
and then if you reply again, it has another RE with a colon. Rather than just one, it increases every time the thread gets longer. RE, 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 RE. So I could see this was a long thread, and it was that girl, and I was curious, so I clicked on it. Okay. And you recognized that girl, and he had described, you said, a prior wild experience that he had with her, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and that wild experience, was that sexual in nature? No. Okay. Well, I don't know. Not, it, that's not what he described. Okay. Would you term it sexual in nature? Um, I would term it more hostile. Okay. So, moving back then to February of 2007, you're reading this uh, email uh, from this female that was sent to Mr. Alexander. Was what you were reading sexual in nature? At first, yes. Okay. So part of the content was sexual. It's my question. It was, it was kind of flirty, not, not very explicit, but there were innuendos. Was there, in the context of this email, was there discussion about them uh, meeting? Yes. And was there information related to when they were going to meet or where they were going to meet? Yes, on the new year. Okay. And as Travis's girlfriend, this didn't please you, is that fair to say? Well, it didn't, it didn't make me elated, but it didn't bother me too much. Did you ask Mr. Alexander about this? No, not right away. Okay. And I want to clarify something earlier because you said, you know, you were his girlfriend, you were happy for a day, and something made you unhappy. And now you're just telling us, well, this email, it didn't make me elated. Did something else make you unhappy, or was it just this email? There was one other thing that really bothered me a lot more than that email. That email was months before we became official, so it was like, eh. It wasn't, I was a little upset because it wasn't what he told me. So I was thinking, yeah, right. But there was another email that was more disturbing. And... Why was that, without going into what it said, why was that disturbing? It was much more sexual in nature, and it was with a married woman, an LDS married woman. Okay. And you said it was sexual in nature. Did you get the sense that this woman and Mr. Alexander were engaged in some sort of affair? I don't know. Um, she lived in Southern California, but they were definitely making plans. Did you speak with Mr. Alexander about this email? Eventually I did, but I spoke to Sky about it first. I wasn't sure what to do. All right. Why not, when you said you weren't sure what to do, why not just break up with him? Well, part of my, my reasoning at the time was this was also something that took place. Um, a few months back, it was before Christmas, and I was a little disturbed by the, it made me question what his values were regarding marriage. Um, but I, I liked him, so I wasn't going to break up with him. You said you liked him. You were his girlfriend at this point in time. Were you in love with him in February 2007? 
I might have been, but I don't recall being in love in love. We, I recall having feelings for him, but I don't know that I could say in love yet. After you left uh, the, his home as, as his girlfriend, uh, did you go back to Palm Desert? Yes. And at that point in time, uh, well, describe the relationship. You're, you're, fa you're hundreds of miles away anyway. Are we back to the phone calls, that sort of thing? Yes, he began to call me more often at that point owing partially to um, everything that had happened between his friends and I and him. And so he was a lot better in how he was treating me. Um, so things began to develop a little bit more rapidly. Okay. You say develop a little more rapidly. You're already boyfriend and girlfriend. Um, what, is it, what is it developing into? Well, um, there was a lot more talk about marriage. We were not engaged. Um, that the subject of marriage was almost discussed from very early on, not necessarily him and I, but he would throw out hypotheticals, if. And then, so now it was more like when he was making plans, it was always we instead of me. So it seemed like I was included more as in his future and his in mine. And based on what you told us earlier, it would seem that at this point in time, being married and, and having a family was still one of your primary, primary goals in life. Is that right? Yes. And in this time period of February 2007, are you still involved in prepaid legal? Yes. Uh, actively, or you just have your membership purchase? How would you describe your? I was. I would describe it as I was very actively involved, but I was not making any money. Okay. So after you leave, and you return after you leave Mr. Alexander's home, you return to Palm Desert. So the relationship is flourishing largely over the phone, right? Yes. Okay. When do you next see Mr. Alexander? We began to see each other about once or twice a month. I'm trying to remember the exact time. I came out to his house again in March, um, just prior to convention. Okay. Well, you mentioned, you said you saw you tried to see each other about every other week, right? About. He would come out to California on average of once a month, and I went started going to Arizona on average of once a month. So he would either come out to your house in Palm Desert, or you would go out to see him in Mesa? Yes. Okay. Until May, he came to Palm Desert. I'm sorry. Until that? May, he would come to Palm Desert. And at this point in time, if I understand you correctly, February 2006, your boyfriend and girlfriend, but you have not had penile vaginal intercourse yet. Is that right? That's right. When did you first have penile vaginal intercourse with Mr. Alexander? It would have been April or May. I, th I think May. Pretty sure May but it could have been April, it was in the spring. Okay. Apart from these trips back and forth between your two homes, and did you, we heard a little earlier about travels, did you, had you traveled together yet? We, Just the two of you? That month of March that I came out before convention was our first, um, it was the first time we traveled together. And where did you go? Um, he wanted to show me the, the um, places that were significant in Mormon church history. So we, we decided to go to 
We flew to Kansas City, Missouri um, to see places in Missouri, um, historical sites. And then we also drove to Nauvoo, Illinois. What was that? Nauvoo, Illinois. And what, um, maybe for those of us who don't know, was there a, just to begin with, was there a historical, something of historical importance in uh, Kansas City? Not in Kansas City, but that was the nearest major airport. Okay. To this uh, Navajo, Illinois? No, to the, the sites in Missouri. Okay. So how long a trip is this to be? I don't remember how many days, but we left a few days early to see those sites and then fly to, or maybe drive, to Oklahoma City, where convention was in the spring. Okay. And your boyfriend and girlfriend at this time as well, right? Yes. Okay. You go to you um, go to Kansas City. Is there a difference in his behavior in terms of how publicly affectionate he is? when you arrive in Kansas City as opposed to when you're back home in Arizona? Um, he's, he's a little bit more distant. Um, we hold hands sometimes, but not often. And that's about the extent. I mean, some, I don't know. Sometimes he wouldn't even hold my hand. It would just be like, he wouldn't introduce me to anybody. Um, anything like that. In Kansas City? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you meant at convention. I no. misunderstood. No. Not at convention. In Kansas City, we talked about, earlier we talked about how you, he acted like just your friend, unless it was in front of Dan or Desiree Freeman or Aaron Dewey. Um, but he acted like your friend, just a friend in public. My question was whether or not when you got to Kansas City um, and you were traveling together where people didn't know you, did that change? Yes, he was more affectionate in those cities when we were out of town. And this trip to these um, Mormon historical sites before you, before you drove to Oklahoma City, how long of a, a trip was that to be? We hit multiple places in a day and then spent the entire day in Nauvoo. I want to say two or three days. Okay. And during these trip to these religious landmarks, uh, and from what you say, and I don't want to assume this, so from what you say, it sounds like there were there were several in this, in the Missouri area. Yes. Okay. And as far as these, you must have spent a couple nights on the road as well, right? Yes, we did. Okay. And did you have separate hotel rooms or just one? No, just one. Two beds or just one? One queen size bed. Was there sexual behavior during this trip? Yes. Oral sex? I don't remember the nature of it. I just remember it was not anything different than what we had been doing. Okay. And was this something fairly consistent throughout the two or three days? that you were on this trip? I think it only occurred once um, okay. and during that portion of the trip. Okay. Now, you talk about going through Missouri, and was the next portion of the trip to fly to Oklahoma, or was there something before that? No, we went to three or four different places in Missouri, then we drove to Nauvoo, okay. Illinois. And then from Illinois, you went to Oklahoma City? 
Yes, we stayed the night in Nauvoo, Illinois. And then we spent the whole day until it was dark again and then drove most of the night, I think, to Oklahoma. I remember driving a long time after Nauvoo. Okay. And you said to convention, that was a prepaid legal convention? Yes. Okay. And based on what we heard before, it sounds like that was one of the two big conventions of the year, right? Yes, there were two conventions per year, and this one was in the spring. Okay. And you mentioned, because I think we got a little, uh, a little bit of miscommunication earlier, you said he was acting like your boyfriend on these trips, but it sounded like when you got to Oklahoma City, things changed. That's correct. Okay. And describe for us again, so we're, we're clear, how did things change in terms of, from a physical standpoint? Um, just, I just sort of became, it seemed like I was just another person there. Um, maybe on a friend acquaintance kind of level. Um, I wasn't expecting, he had told me ahead of time that convention is crazy and all that. Um, but there were plenty of moments where we were all just hanging out and he wasn't incredibly affectionate. Um, but there was one time where we were up very late and we were in the, uh, the hotel lobby and um, I was really tired. But I stayed to hang out with everyone and he put a pillow on his lap and let me lay there. So that was really nice of him. But other than that, he was actually very flirtatious with another woman. Okay. Without going into the details of that, Flirtation. You said he was flirtatious with another woman. Was that in front of you? Yes. That hurt your feelings? Yes, it hurt my feelings. Did you ever say anything to him about it? Afterward, um, after the incident, we ended up talking about it. In the past, you had mentioned how it was difficult for you to bring these things up to him, right? Yes. What gave you the courage or strength to, to bring this up to him? I didn't bring it up to him this time. He came to me. I think he knew he screwed up. Okay. And once he brought it up to you, uh, was all forgiven? Um, eventually, yeah, we talked a few minutes. Um, getting into it again made me cry because it was, it was very blatant what he did and he was very apologetic. What about the way he treated you at this convention, this kind of, well, what about this disparity between the affectionate behavior you saw when you were going through Missouri and the behavior during the convention? How did that sudden change to being just going from girlfriend, someone he's intimate with at nights in the hotel room to just being one of his buddies at the convention. Did you say how did that? Yeah, how did that make you feel? Um, I didn't actually overanalyze it because this was a business convention. Nevertheless, there were couples there that were friendly outside of the business sessions. There's a lot of personal time and hanging out and partying. Um, so I saw other couples being affectionate. I don't mean making out, just sitting next to each other, holding hands. Travis and I didn't do that. Um, so it hurt my feelings a little, but it was very mild in comparison to the way um, he was actually acting with another woman. Okay. So when the, how, how long was the convention? How long were you two just buds? 
convention lasts two days and there was a breakout. I can't remember this time if the breakout came before or after convention. Okay. Uh, do you share a hotel room with Mr. Alexander? Definitely not. We were in separate hotel rooms. You say definitely not. What do you mean by that? Um, well, he explained to me that it wasn't looked upon very well when to stay in the same hotel room. Um, plus, because we weren't married, we weren't going to get the same hotel room. Um, we would stay in, he would stay in a room with a bunch of guys, and I would stay in a room with a bunch of girls, and we would all split the cost. I'm a little confused then because it seems like uh, this man had concern about the appearances at the convention, but didn't have any concerns about sharing a hotel with, room with you a, di a, a night or two beforehand, right? Yes. Did you ever question him about that disparity? No, I knew that it was a church standard, um, and I knew that we were going against the church standard when no one else knew about it. Um, but not that time. Eventually that came up between us, but at the convention I didn't. Okay. Do you, you and Travis, do you, how do you return back to, well, where do you go after the convention's over? Um, we, I believe we flew directly back from Oklahoma City to Phoenix. You flew together? Yes. Just the two of you, or were there other, I mean, obviously it wasn't your own plane, but I mean, were there other associates or friends that were involved in this trip? There might have been other friends on that flight because tons of people go, but not that I recall. We booked those flights together and it was just us. Okay. When you get back from Oklahoma City, uh, do you spend time with Travis or do you, or do you immediately go back to Palm Desert? Um, trying to remember. I believe that night we got back on a Sunday and he used to go to dinner at his friend's house on Sundays and that Sunday I went, well, that Sunday I went with him. Okay. Did you spend more days with him? I believe I stayed Sunday night and then left Monday. That Sunday night before, well, let me ask you this. When he went, you went to the home of his friends. Had you met these people before? No. Did he introduce you to them as, your, uh, as his girlfriend? No, I was kind of just a friend. Did that hurt? Um, if it did, I was ignoring it. I can't recall thinking anything particular about it. Okay. That evening, do you go to this home and you, you're introduced as, a, as his buddy again. When you go back to the home, is there more sexual activity? The night before I left, um, I really don't recall on that night. Okay. Judge, perhaps it's about three. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take the afternoon recess. Please be back in the designated area at 320. Please remember the admonition. You are excused. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the Jury, the defendant, and all counsel, you may continue. Ms. Arias, before we move completely past uh, the convention in Oklahoma City, um, you had mentioned some incident that uh, had made you upset during this convention. Yes. Uh, that made you more upset than being treated as his buddy during this convention, right? 
Yes, I can't say that being treated as buddy made me really upset, just kind of bothered me. Okay. What was this incident that you're talking about that, that hurt your feelings so significantly? Well, um, we were, this was the night of the executive director banquet, and I went again with Travis that night. Um, after that banquet, most people like to change out of their tuxedos and gowns or whatever fancy dresses that they're wearing into clothing that's more comfortable. Um, so Travis and I did that. I was in jeans or whatever, and he changed out to the same. And um, some people will stay in their dresses. There was um, one woman that came down the stairs from another level of the lobby, I guess. We were in the lobby area of the Sheraton Hotel. And she was very, very drunk, and she almost couldn't stand up. And so she began to hang all over various men, um, slurring things, making jokes that nobody really understood. Um, everyone was laughing at her, though. Um, it was kind of funny. Um, I thought it was kind of funny at the time, too, so I flipped open my phone and started video recording her. Um, just so I could show her the next day. Um, so everything was kind of, we were just laughing, and then she, am I allowed to say what she said? Well, let's ask, let me get specifically to what was it about this, this drunk woman, uh, as you describe her, did she have an interaction with Travis or something that made you upset? Yes, um, she was hanging all over two guys, and then, um, after that, she kind of lurched over to Travis and fell on him a little. And he held her up, and they were facing um, each other very close. And he was holding her around the waist, and she had her arms around his shoulders. And she had this very sexy black gown on, um, very generous cleavage, um, kind of pressed up against his chest. And he looked like he was loving every minute of it. And I was sitting down on a couch nearby. He was probably about five feet in that direction. And um, I had already shut my phone at this point because the video didn't last that long. Um, I just got this feeling inside like my stomach flip-flopped. Like I, I couldn't believe he was doing that. Um, not just doing it, but doing it right in front of me and in front of all our friends. I thought, I was under the impression that most of our friends, Dan was there, Aaron Dewey was there, that other people understood we were together and I didn't feel like that behavior was appropriate. Um, but I didn't want to make a scene, so I stood up and I was hurt. I, I felt like I wanted to cry, but I didn't really want anyone to see that. So I decided I was going to go to the bathroom. Um, but in order to get to the bathroom, I had to walk right past them. So I passed them, and they stopped me briefly, and I kind of, I don't remember what she was slurring, but he was just kind of laughing, and they were swaying and just going like that. And I just said, smiled and said, you know, I, I don't know if I said much. I just kept walking after that. And I went into the bathroom and into a stall and sat down on one of the toilets and just started crying. Now, did you express, this sounds like it was pretty upsetting to you. Yeah, it hurt my feelings. Did you express that to Travis? Eventually. I was more appalled with the fact that he was doing it right in front of me and that he was doing it at all. But it definitely hurt my feelings, and I, I stayed in the bathroom for quite some time. Um, Leslie Udy came in. I believe it was her. It sounded like her voice. Uh, a few times calling my name. I think she knew I was in there, um, but every time I heard the door open, I put my feet up so that no one could see me in the stall because I didn't want to, I didn't want anyone to understand or to know that I was upset. Um, so she left and after the second time she came in and then left, I finally exited the stall. Um, why, why, let me stop you for a minute. Why would you not want people to know that you were upset? I guess I was, I felt ashamed for some reason that he was acting that way. I felt ashamed. I don't, I can't really explain why. I guess I just felt like 
maybe I would be perceived as someone who didn't deserve anything better or someone who was maybe overly dramatic or overreacting or emotional, too emotional. Um, I didn't want, I wanted to be perceived more as just cool and calm and like shrug it off like, ah, oh, whatever, because maybe there wasn't any meaning behind it. But even though they were very physically suggestive, or at least close and pressing their bodies up against each other, um, and it lasted quite some time, I just still was thinking, well, maybe there wasn't anything to that. Maybe it didn't mean anything. So I didn't want others to think that I was overreacting. Okay. Now you mentioned that you brought this up with Travis. Did you do that before you left Oklahoma City or was that after you got home? It was shortly after I, um, I left the stall. I, I checked my makeup because I had cried it all off and my eyes were really puffy and red. So I didn't want to give myself away. So I tried to make myself appear like I wasn't crying. Um, and then at that point, I think a half hour had passed. So I left the bathroom and um, <coughs> I started, I had to walk past the same area again. Most of that group had dispersed, so I decided to walk really fast toward the elevators, and hopefully no one would notice me, but somebody did, and called my name, and out of, just to be polite, I stopped and said hi, and, and then continued on to the elevators. Um, and then as I was getting near the elevator, Travis texted me and asked me where I was. So after he texted you, did you get together and talk about it then? Yes, I, I forgot actually one thing I did before you texted me. Well, let's, let's just focus on the conversation you had with Mr. Alexander. Okay. That happened that night in Oklahoma City? Yes, it did. And where did that conversation take place? It actually took place, um, he was getting, trying to get on the same elevator I was, but from his floor. So we figured that out, and I rode the elevator up, and he met me at the elevator. He met you on the elevator? Um, as I came off the elevator. Okay. So where, do you, where, where are you when you talk about this? We are outside the elevator. Um, there is a long hallway, but then before you, right before the hallway, there is a small table and a chair, maybe two chairs. We were there. Okay, so you sit down and you talk about this event. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And are you yelling at him? Are you crying? What is your emotion when you're expressing your, uh, how upset you are with him? I had calmed down a lot. I didn't want to leave the bathroom until I was cool and collected. So I calmed down a lot, but as he, as he, got me to talk about it, it got me upset again, so I started crying some, and he reassured me and just said some nice things. Okay. And that kind of ended the discussion about it there, at least in Oklahoma City? Um, that didn't really end the discussion. As I was going to sleep that night, he sent me a very nice text message, um, very apologetic, saying that he wanted to be better. Yeah, here's Sorry. In terms of the conversation, the verbal conversation, that ended at the table in the hallway, right? Yes, the, yeah, okay. when we were present with each other. So you leave Oklahoma City, you've had a conversation with about this incident. Um, you were telling us earlier how you had um, spent some time uh, at a friend of Travis's house, had dinner there. And I think we're at a point in time where you were about ready to return to Palm Desert, right? Yes. Okay. And how far of a drive is Palm Desert from Mesa? I, I remember it being approximately five, five and a half hours, depending on how fast you drive. Now, did you have a uh, job back in Palm Desert at that time? Yes. Okay. And where were you working? I was working at 
Quisto and I'm trying to remember. I think it was California Pizza Kitchen. Okay. Now at this point in time though, you were also telling us that you were seeing Travis every week, maybe every other week. Um, so after you returned from convention, when was the next time that you saw him? We, um, I saw him again the following weekend. There was um, a recap. They usually have some kind of recap um, event the week following convention, um, I guess, in various regions. And Travis came to Southern California to the one that I would go to. OK. And uh, you said Southern California. Where was this um, follow-up? Or, or I believe it was either in Anaheim or a city near that. OK. Uh, did you share a hotel room together? No, he stayed with friends and family, I think. OK. And did you have a hotel room? I stayed. Oh, yeah, we, we were all staying at the same house, friends. Okay. Any sexual activity at that point in time? That night? I think we had, we did in that house during those times, but I don't recall that specific night. Okay. Do you recall whose home it was? Yes. Who? It was Chris and Sky Hughes' parents' home. Okay. When you were at this event, forgive me, I forget what you referred to it as, a post? A recap. Po recap, okay. Yeah. This post-convention recap, uh, was his behavior the same it was in Oklahoma City in terms of how he treated you uh, as, a, as a buddy or a colleague uh, as opposed to his girlfriend? Yes. He was friendly, but not anything more than that. Okay. And was he flirtatious with other women in front of you during this recap? Um, I don't recall. He was, he's always very friendly with women, but I don't recall anything that sticks out. Okay. So after this recap is over, uh, do you both return to your respective homes? No, the recap was one day on Saturday and we stayed the night at the the Hughes' parents' home. So it was, um, it was a ranch, and we were out there, and there was a party. So a lot of people came over. Um, it was a social event. And after the party dispersed, we hung out and went to sleep. Okay. In the same bedroom? Yes. OK. When you were at this ranch, as you described it, meeting a bunch of people. Um, did he introduce you as his girlfriend? No. Was it just, this is my friend Jody? He okay, didn't introduce me at all. What's that? He didn't introduce me at all. So after this uh, party at the ranch, what happens next? I mean, do you, do you stay at the ranch a few more days, or is this the last day you're on the ranch? A few more days. Um, I think I left Monday evening. Okay. And left, you mean go, to go back to Palm Desert? Um, Travis wanted to meet up with me in Riverside that night, so he told me to go to, I don't remember what it's called, but it's, I think it's called the Mission or something. It's kind of a tourist destination in Riverside. He said it's a beautiful place for photographs and that I could get some nice pictures um, while he finishes up whatever he was doing at their house. So I I had to um, I, I had to go to Verizon and then I went there and took some pictures. Okay. And did Mr. Alexander then meet you at this uh, Mission Inn? 
No, um, when he arrived in Riverside, he, I can't, oh, he gave me directions to his grandmother's house. Okay. And this house, was this also located in Riverside? Yes. Okay. To my understanding. Okay. And uh, was this, by the time he had contacted you and given directions to his grandmother's house, was this, what time of day was this, if you can recall? It was the evening, it was dark, but it wasn't very late. Okay. So did he then, uh, did you go to his grandma's house? Yes. Okay. Did he introduce you to his grandmother? Yes. Okay. As his girlfriend? No. What, what, did, what did the three of you do uh, while you were at his grandmother's house? We just stayed. I'm trying to remember, I think I met her three times and I'm, I don't want to get those things out of order. Um, but the time that I left um, Temecula, which was where the ranch was, I believe, and then I went over to meet her um, we only stayed for a few minutes, and it was a little awkward. I mean, I think I might have been meeting her for the first time, or, um, and Travis was kind of just standing there, and then he and I left to go to Barnes & Noble. Okay. Where did you wind up spending the night that evening? That evening, I think I drove home. After you got back to Palm Desert, when we, what we we're talking about January of 2007 still, is that accurate? No, um, convention was late March. Uh, the recap was a week later. I think um, the party was on March 31st because it was the last day of the month. Let me back up then. Uh, and was he in, at this convention and this recap? Um, you were at least to the to the both of your, at least the way you two looked at it anyway. You were boyfriend and girlfriend. Is that right? Yes. Okay. In between January and March. It was Valentine's Day, right? Yes. Did you spend Valentine's Day with Mr. Alexander? No. Did he provide you with any Valentine's gifts? Yes. How did those, uh, did he deliver them himself or, or were they shipped to you? They were shipped to me. We weren't together on Valentine's Day because I worked. And also the relationship was still kind of new, like 12 days prior, we barely made it official. So I didn't have any big expectations for Valentine's Day, but I came home between jobs uh, in the afternoon and there was a package on my doorstep. And did you open the package right away? Was it, well, let me ask you this. Was it easily identifiable to you who the package was from? Yes, his return address was on it. Okay. Did you call him before you opened it, or did you open it? I opened it before calling him. What was in this package? There were a variety of things. Um, when I opened it on top were some chocolates, um, Reese's peanut butter cups, and I think the little Halloween size, fun size um, Hershey bars. Um, they were all melted completely. I guess they'd melted being outside. Um, so I put them in the refrigerator. And then um, beneath that was a shirt um, that he had been joking about getting me for some months, or weeks maybe, it was over a month. Um, and it's- Could you describe the shirt for us? Yes, it's the one that was in the picture, it said Travis Alexander's. What else? Um, I laughed because it was, 
an inside joke that he had been making for a while. I didn't think he would actually get me a shirt like that, but he would joke about doing that. And so I um, took it out of the package and lifted it up, and there were also other items underneath it. I'm sorry, you say that again? There were other items underneath it. And what other items were there? Um, the pink shorts, which I didn't see his name on the back at first. I just picked him up, and I thought they were cute. Let me show you what's been marked as exhibit number 417. Is that the shirt and shorts you're talking about uh, receiving from Mr. Alexander on Valentine's Day? Yes. Valentine's Day 2007? Yes. Okay. You, know, you mentioned some melted chocolate, uh, t-shirt, shorts. Uh, was there anything else in this package? Yes, there was one other um, thing beneath the shorts. What was that? Um, they were they were boys' underwear. They were Spider-Man underwear. And did it seem strange to you that you were receiving those? I was confused at first. Um, they were still in the package. I don't remember the size, but um, they were like packaged um, like in a vacuum sealed package with the cardboard, you know, so you could see the different styles of Spider-Man that were um, in that package. And I thought at the time... Well, let me ask you this. Was there anything else in that package? Was this there was this? a nice letter okay. also. Judge, may we approach you? Yes. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take the evening recess at this time. As I told you yesterday, there will be no court tomorrow, so we will see you back here on Monday at 1030. Please remember the admonition. Are there any questions? Have a nice weekend. You are excused. The record will show the jury has left the courtroom. Please be seated. Ms. Arias, you may step down. Counsel, is there anything else for today? No, Your Honor. Thank you. 1030. Thank, thank you. you.